So, as the title indicates, uh, this is a uh, discussion event about uh, global issues and global events. It's a virtual panel discussion hosted by uh, the Department of Political Science and School of Education and Behavioral Sciences here at Middle Georgia State University. Uh, our event is also co-sponsored by the MJA Political Science Student Organization, as well as the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honoring Society for Students of Political Science. Um, before we get started, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about our program for those of you that might be new to these events, um, as well as introducing uh, the people that will be uh, participating in our panel. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the structure of the event and uh, go from there. So um, without uh, further ado, um, first, just wanted to very briefly introduce uh, our programs. Uh, so our department offers two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor of science degree in political science, as well as a bachelor of science degree in interdisciplinary studies, which is a degree for students that are interested in combining uh, multiple different uh, areas of uh, re scholarship uh, in their degree program. Uh, we also have uh, several different minors that you can add on to any degree that's offered at the undergraduate level, or at least any bachelor's degree that's offered at the undergraduate level at MGA. Um, those minors include political science, uh, African and African diaspora studies, um, environmental policy studies, uh, global studies, and pre-law. Uh, we also offer, in collaboration with several other universities in Georgia, uh, the Certificate in European Union Studies, which is a little bit broader than the title indicates. It also uh, looks at not just the European Union, but also Europe. European politics and culture and society a bit more broadly as well. Um, and again, that's a collaborative program that involves uh, Middle Georgia State as well as uh, quite a few other uh, state universities here in Georgia. I think there are nine participants at the moment. Uh, and that all, that's a uh, program that we offer uh, collaboratively online. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, classes for the spring, uh, if you're looking for those courses, those will be the Euro courses in uh, the uh, the course schedule. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a few people that are joining us today to uh, discuss things. Um, want to introduce them. Um, so first, uh, we have uh, Dr. John Hall, who's an associate professor of political science um, and has been here at Middle Georgia State University since 2015. Uh, his uh, doctorate is in public policy administra and administration from Auburn University. Uh, we're also uh, pleased to be joined by our uh, Fulbright Scholar, uh, Dr. Yuri Lovoda, uh, who is visiting us uh, from the uh, National Defense University of Ukraine. And um, not to put him on the spot, but I'm sure he has some insights that he'd like to share on uh, at least some of these events. And so uh, we're, we're glad to have him as part of our panel. Um, glad to have him with us today. Um, we also have, uh, or I guess, um, we also have a number of faculty in the audience that may contribute as well. Um, and uh, I will be also uh, participating as the moderator and discussion ringleader and um, monitoring the chat and all the other things, keeping the uh, stream running as well. I'm Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and a professor of political science. Uh, I've been here at MGA since 2012, uh, and my doctorate in political science is uh, from the University of Mississippi. Um, so as far as our event structure goes, those of you that have been to our events before are probably familiar with this already, but um, the panelists have uh, discussed a few potential topics, and we'll uh, talk about uh, those, um, which will be phrased sort of as questions or discussion prompts. Um, we also, though, are... are interested in your questions um, and hopefully we'll try to be able to answer your questions over the next hour and a half or so. A um, couple of just ground rules. Um, first, uh, please be uh, uh, civil to each other and courteous. Uh, I know some of these topics can be controversial and involve uh, a lot of uh, different uh, issues and things like that, but uh, I definitely would encourage you to uh, be civil and courteous to other participants of the discussion. Um, 
as well as um, the other ground rule is basically that um, while you're more than welcome to ask as many questions as you might have, uh, nonetheless, to uh, give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. If we do have lots of questions, sometimes we have a lot of questions, sometimes we don't. Uh, but if we do have a lot of questions, uh, I um, will try to give everybody at least one question they get to ask or um, and then um, if there is time, uh, we'll let uh, people uh, follow up or ask additional questions if necessary. But we do want to make sure that people don't feel like that uh, the the discussion is being monopolized by um, one or two participants, um, or at least the questions are being monopolized by one or two participants. Uh, so um, as far as our uh, potential uh, discussion topics or questions that are likely to be asked. Um, we have a couple of questions, few questions on the uh, conflict in Ukraine, uh, which of course is probably one of the, if not the um, most prominent issue in international politics and global relations at the moment. Um, but there are lots of other things going on in the world as well, and so we want to make sure we have some uh, time to talk about some of those. We may talk about all of these, we may talk about some of them, um, depending on the enthusiasm of the panelists and the audience. Um, so uh, also on uh, the borders or the within the region, I guess, of the former uh, Russian Empire, we have uh, the uh, conflict between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia and the the uh, uh, region of Nagorno-Karabakh um, that has uh, recently re-emerged in the news very suddenly um, after a little bit of a quiet period. Um, the uh, uh, Not to be outdone, China has decided it's also going to do a bit of saber rattling in the East uh, as uh, elections are approaching in Taiwan, and perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in Africa, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we've had a number of uh, coups and attempted coups in in really the last couple months. Um, and I don't know if there's some so, something in the water going on in West Africa or something, but we'll talk a little bit about that in uh, countries like uh, Gabon, uh, Niger, and uh, Burkina Faso. Um, and then, uh, depending on the, uh, again, the, the enthusiasm of the panel, I may have to carry the discussion on these. Um, uh, some upcoming elections, my passion of comparative politics coming to the fore, I guess. Um, and uh, we may talk a little bit about upcoming elections in countries such as Argentina, Ecuador, New Zealand, the Netherlands. There's also Swiss elections coming up. If you really want to talk about the Swiss elections, we could talk about um, that, or maybe you just talk about chocolate, I don't know, um, or, or, or or banks or something to do with Switzerland. Um, but the, I actually forgot entirely about Swiss elections coming up until I remembered earlier that I forgot to put it on the list. But So nobody, uh, nobody has to uh, answer any questions about Switzerland uh, today, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, there is a Swiss election coming up, which will um, do what elections in Switzerland normally do, which is return a new government in Switzerland. So um, uh, without um, belaboring the point, um, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, get ourselves started. Um, bear with me a little bit while so try to um, admit people to our uh, uh, event and things like that as well. So let me uh, make this uh, thing go away. Um, and We'll stop presenting and we'll start talking about our uh, first uh, first topic. Um, so, uh, so our first topic is the conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Um, and I guess it's sort of a very kind of uh, 50,000 foot overview um, or about 13,000 meters, give or take. Um, we should uh, kind of give a... Uh, update on the current status of the conflict uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. I know it's been a while since we had one of these discussion events about um, Russia and Ukraine. It's probably been about six months or so. So, um, so for returning people and you know, kind of to see what's happened over the last few months, and also for to get new people up to speed as well. Um, what's been going on and uh, how is it uh, changing? And uh, um, I guess John, do you want to lead off and? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you for being here, Dr. Caverly, Dr. Lester, and of course, uh, Dr. Labona. Um, 
And it looks like uh, the dean of our college, Dr. Beek, just arrived. So we are all glad to have Dr. Beek. Um, great question. Uh, in terms of the 10,000 foot overview of the Russian, I, I don't like to say the, the Ukrainian war, that implies something that it's not. These are uh, Russian war crimes in Ukraine. There is nothing uh, that is uh, acceptable about this uh, war in Ukraine. Basically, we go back uh, to about 2014. Uh, President Putin um, sent in Russian troops and seized the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, this is something that was internationally uh, condemned. Sanctions were immediately imposed on Russia. Fast forward several years, and we get to February of 2022, last year, uh, when, as U.S. intelligence agencies were predicting, there was a full-scale mobilization and invasion of Ukraine, a sovereign nation-state that is a liberal democracy, by Russia. Uh, this invasion was terrifying, obviously, uh, but it's important to note that in terms of how things are going in Ukraine, it is a miracle that Ukraine exists. Uh, absolutely all experts, myself included, I would assume everyone on the panel, uh, everyone that's joining us would have thought that the, the might of the Russian military would have crushed Ukraine in a matter of days. That is actually the prediction that was made. Uh, but the extraordinary bravery and skill of the Ukrainians uh, saw them pushing back against the uh, the Russians. The Russian invasion that attempted to take the capital city of Kiev uh, was pushed back. Uh, Russian special forces were annihilated. Uh, while there were gains across most of eastern and southern Ukraine in 2022, something amazing happened in the summer of 2022. And there was a counteroffensive by Ukrainian forces uh, that was exceptionally um, successful. Uh, they pushed Russians out of many areas of Ukraine that had been occupied, uh, so that we settled on something of a stalemate. As of now, there are significant Russian forces in eastern Ukraine and in southern Ukraine. The long expected counteroffensive in 2023 is still underway. It has been slower than many expected, but the reason it's slower than many expected is because many, when we reference many and the expectations of many, have absolutely no military training and don't truly understand what it's like on the ground. The Russians spent months uh, laying literally millions of mines. They have uh, laid um, defensive positions, trenches, anti-tank uh, mines, anti-tank uh, obstacles. It is an extraordinarily difficult uh, military endeavor, what the Ukrainians are trying right now. But the advantage that they have is that they are succeeding. They are pushing uh, into the southern regions of occupied Ukraine. Uh, they're having success in the Zaporizhia region, uh, which Zaporizhia is an interesting city because it's home to the largest nuclear um, energy facility in all of Europe uh, with bombs occasionally landing near it. Uh, so in terms of a quick overview of what's going on, the Ukrainians almost two years after the initial illegal invasion by the Russian forces are holding their own. Uh, they've had extraordinary successes pushing back the Russians, and right now they are slowly but surely pushing the Russians further back uh, as they continue this counteroffensive. Now, one of the more significant elements of this war, and we'll get to this probably in the next question, involves aid, foreign aid from other nation states. Uh, NATO countries, including the United States, have in an evolutionary process been sending more and more and more complex weapon systems to the Ukrainians, weapon systems that it would have been unthinkable for the U.S. to send to an ally fighting Russia just years ago. Uh, the biggest ticket item that's coming up soon will be F-16s. Uh, F-16s, in addition to being one of the more successful weapon systems ever designed, they are extraordinarily plentiful. All NATO nations have them, and the U.S. months ago, President Biden agreed to allow F-16s to be given to the Ukrainians. That will significantly change everything sometime next year, maybe around next summer when Ukrainian pilots have been effectively trained on the F-16s. That'll open up a whole array of weapon systems that can be used to fire against Russian forces, and it'll give them a lot better chance at achieving some kind of, not superiority, but some kind of a control over their own skies. As I am getting deeper and deeper into this answer, it occurs to me that there is no end to this answer. Uh, so I'm gonna try to force myself to find a stopping point. What is occurring in Ukraine right now is a miracle from the very first day the Russians invaded. Everyone thought they would have been annihilated. They have not been. And what they've been doing is costing the Russians tens of thousands of soldiers that can't be replaced. They're costing the Russians um, ammunition, artillery shells, weapon systems that cannot be replaced. 
The sanctions that the international community has placed on Russia have been extraordinarily significant, and they are impacting Russia's ability to wage war. The Ukrainians are pulling off a Herculean effort to not only survive the initial Russian attack, but to slowly push them back. And that is where we are right now. And I'm going to leave out about a thousand details and open the floor to uh, Chris, if you'd like to fill anything in, or obviously, uh, Dr. Lobota, if you would like to jump in. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I guess I really wanted to give uh, Dr. Lovato first a, an opportunity to, to, to jump in since he hasn't had an opportunity to speak on this, and um, we'd certainly love to hear his perspective. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so uh, for, the only one thing I can say that uh, we are outnumbered, we are outgunned, and uh, I think this year we can we can resist by, but I think the next year just everyone will be killed. I guess uh, uh, the, the the quantity of enemy is superior. It's several times much more than Ukrainian army, and it will be total genocide in the center of Ukraine. So I'm I'm quite pessimistic about that. And no matter how patriotic and uh, uh you know and um uh, how to say and uh no matter how patriotic ukrainian uh, soldiers and civilians are we are still outnumbered we suffer in heavy losses and we do not receive um uh, essential and significant help from the people who disarmed ukraine before and uh, it's a huge tragedy. It's a huge tragedy not for Ukraine only. It's a huge tragedy for Europe because after Ukraine, Russia will attack uh, NATO states, Baltic states, Poland, and, uh, and I think with the same result. So uh, sorry for be, being so pessimistic, but I know what's going on and. Uh, 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 we're just suffering, suffering at huge losses, and we are very close to total defeat. Only because we are just outnumbered, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, kill just all those thousands of Russians that are emerging and emerging due the uh, total mobilization in, in Russia because it's really total. It's covered total mobilization. We killed about uh, one, uh, 150,000 of people, but we lost uh, almost the same the same quantity. But our, our army is not endless, and sometime uh, will a moment will will arrive that we will be just defenseless because we lost all our people because. Uh, it's it's too it's too many it's, it's too many tanks against us too many uh, rockets too many uh, soldiers and we are just outnumbered it's miracle miracles do not exist uh, unless just uh, maybe in some in some very not numerous cases like Finland in 1940 or Afghanistan in 80s uh, we, we are quite different it's a genocidal war and Russia will not stop killing just every Ukrainian they will attack attack uh, of course Europe and uh, this is what Baltic states and uh, and Poland realize absolutely clearly that's why they had they help us so so widely but uh, but it, it, it doesn't it doesn't solve all our problems because we are we don't have so many weapons we don't have rockets because our rockets were destroyed during disarmament of ukraine started by in in the in 90s and successfully completed in 2000s so yeah it's a huge tragedy and uh, but we are not the first and we are not the last who will be will be killed by the by the aggressor in this history so and uh, this this is what, what's going on sorry for, for being so so pessimistic it's just it's just facts thank you 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lamona and um, John. Do you have anything you wanted to, to add, or I think that's a great point uh, that Dr. Lamona made um, with regard to the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, Ukraine was the location of, correct me if I'm wrong, hundreds. I don't know if it was literally thousands of Soviet nuclear warheads. And one of the principal reasons why the international community was able to get Ukraine to give up those nuclear warheads, giving them back. I believe in the Soviet Union, some may have been dismantled, was because of a promise that the international community would not allow Russian aggression in Ukraine. We now, from all the way back to the illegal seizure of Crimea in 2014 to the outright invasion February of 2022, we have seen an invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So the international community, in addition to the thousand other great reasons to continually work to prevent Russian subjugation and annihilation of Ukraine, we made an agreement that we would protect them in exchange for giving up nuclear weapons. Um, I'll give that back to you, Chris. I don't know if we're bleeding into the next question. Uh, no, I, I think that you know we can uh, address that question separately. Um, you know, I, I I definitely agree with uh, not necessarily. I don't know. If I'm necessarily as pessimistic as Dr. Woboda is. Um, that said, um, you know he, he's 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 Ukrainian. He's been there on the ground. He he knows what's going on in his country. Um, and they are definitely in a tougher position than a lot of people, I think, probably in the West appreciate. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, as, as Dr. Dr. Hall has pointed out, um, you know, the what they've accomplished so far is great and um, beyond all expectations. But but as Dr. Lobota says, you know, the question is, is it sustainable, right? Is this something that, you know, and, um, you know, I think any military would have difficulty countering a larger military force that is dedicated to trying to complete its mission, right? Um, and, um, you know, unless something changes in Russia, unless the costs are increased for Russia, unless... You know, unless internally the costs become too high to bear, right, for Russia, um, then then, you know, there aren't that many constraints on their ability to outraise, outgun um, a country like Ukraine or a country like Finland or a country like Estonia or a country like, um, you know, Poland even. Right. And that's part of the reason why countries like Finland and Estonia and Poland are part of NATO, are part of an alliance, because um, they know they can't stand alone, um, that there aren't that many countries around the world that really could stand alone against an aggression by a country that has the resources of Russia or China or the United States or, you know, a, a large military power, right? Um, and so, and of course, Ukraine, um, was led to believe that they had some degree of protection, although certainly not the degree of protection that being a member of NATO would have given them, um, when they gave up their nuclear weapons, right? And I think that is, as Dr. Lobota has pointed out, that's, that is a real tragedy, and it is a real tragedy that um, that Russia was emboldened, I would say, in 2014 uh, to to do what it did. Um, you know, I think that in retrospect, a lot of people in the United States on both sides of the aisle would probably say that we made a gross strategic blunder um, in um, in believing that Putin was a guy you could do business with. Um, and um, at the time, people that pointed out that this was a gross strategic blunder were, were frankly, not treated well. <laughs> um, uh, by by the establishment, by the media, by a lot of people, right? Who who you know, um, you know, yeah, there were people that definitely mocked the quote unquote reset button, but um, but at the same time, um, you know, there it's also the case that um, you know people that were skeptical of Russia's intentions were not paid attention to. Um, you know, we're we're seen as being fi fighting the old war when the reality is that. This is kind of Russia's playbook, right? Is to you know try to expand its influence into what it considers to be its backyard, and um, you know it has no compunctions about using its military and killing not just civilians from those countries, but its own people um, to do that, right? Um, at a rate and a scale that would not be tolerated 
um, in a country like the United States, right? Um, you know, I don't think we would. One, I don't think we we tolerate the degree the degree of civilian casualties, but more more to the point, I don't think we tolerate the degree of casualties among our own forces um, that would be required to do such things. Um, nor I do, nor do I think a lot of countries would. Um, but but that's something you can do in an authoritarian totalitarian state. Um, now the. the the, there's an interesting question from the chat. I think it's worth pointing out, right? You know, the question is, you know, why would why would Russia nuke Ukraine in the first place? And it's not that Russia would nuke Ukraine, right? Russia probably won't nuke Ukraine. I don't know why they would. Um, um, they, you know, they have um, uh, superiority in terms of conventional military forces. Um, the the point is that nuclear weapons are often used as a deterrent, right? Um, one of the reasons, arguably, why countries like North Korea and Iran are able to do what they do um, and defy other countries is because they have or threaten or are close to having nuclear weapons. Um, one of the reasons why that it's um, an invasion by the Arab countries of Israel has become increasingly unlikely is because Israel has nuclear weapons. Um, and, um, you know, and that has what we call a deterrent effect, right? It's, um, you know, the, basically the idea is if you attack our country, we will nuke you in response. Um, and, you know, had, had Ukraine kept its nuclear weapons, um, it would have had a credible threat to say to the Russians, you know, if you try to take over Crimea, if you try to take over the Donbass region, um, then, um, then we will, you know, destroy St. Petersburg in response, right? Um, and they don't have that capability anymore, right? And so Putin and the Soviet re or the Russian regime is able to do that, right? Um, and because, again, Ukraine doesn't have a conventional military that's capable of delivering similar sort of destruction on Russian soil, um, they don't have that sort of deterrent. Right. They, they don't have that ability to deter uh, an attack or an invasion or that sort of thing. So um, so just to kind of speak to uh, that that particular question from the chat. Um, so. Um, so I guess we should probably get to our follow up question, um, which has to do with aid and uh, the lack thereof, I guess. Um, um, you know, the, the U.S. There's been a lot of discussion the last few weeks about you know whether or not the U.S. should continue to give assistance to um, the Ukrainians. Um, you know, I think there's um, you know, and we've seen a eroding majority of the public supporting uh, U.S. aid to Ukraine, and that culminated, of course, in the uh, uh, temporary stopgap funding measure that passed Congress this past week. Uh, before the latest drama in Congress that we won't really get into today. Um, we'll probably talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but, um, and that is, um, you know, that we basically decided that we were not going to include any additional aid for Ukraine in the, um, what was called the continuing resolution. So essentially the, the budget continuation for uh, the next 45 days. Um, whether or not that means there will not be any separate um aid is kind of up in the air um it's possible there will be it's possible there won't be it's possible that you know um you know it could be further down the road than 45 days it could be that it doesn't really you know over the over the the short term maybe it doesn't really matter all that much to have a few dollars here or there but maybe the symbolism is more important um so so I guess the question is, you know, is what sort of impact is this likely to have, or is there likely to be any impact? Um, and uh, we can go from there, I guess. Great question, Chris. Um, I don't know if Dr. Lobato wanted to jump on, but I will if he doesn't. Um, first and foremost, it's important to note uh, what Dr. Lawrence said is correct. There is some dwindling support for Ukrainian aid. That's understandable. We've given roughly 75 plus billion dollars uh, to Ukraine, uh, about 60% of that has been in military aid. However, it's important to note that in 15 different polls that I double checked today, American public opinion supporting aid to Ukraine is still well uh, in the majority, it's in a supermajority. If you look at the House and the Senate, 
you're in the numbers of 80% of Republicans and Democrats in the legislative branch who still fundamentally support aid to Ukraine. So the support from the American people, from Congress, obviously from the Biden administration is still very much there to support Ukraine long run. Uh, and we've already been here for almost two years and the support is still there. Having said that, in terms of without getting bogged down in the local politics here or the national politics, uh, there's something of a revolution going on in the Republican Party right now. Uh, they have a nine seat majority in the House and they just uh, voted to basically decapitate themselves and they took out their own Speaker of the House. Now that will create a situation where for several weeks until we have a new Speaker of the House, there won't be much movement there. Uh, but having said that, there's still a great deal of support for aid to Ukraine. They are going through roughly around two and a half billion dollars of uh, military expenditures per month. We currently have a little over $5 billion still left over from past appropriations. So we're still looking at a couple of months with relatively consistent aid uh, that's already there. But eventually, uh, the Republican Party will elect a new speaker. And I believe eventually there will be uh, approval of some version of the Biden administration's recent aid request. Uh, the continuing resolution that temporarily funds the federal government uh, over the next couple of months uh, was missing about $13 billion of additional U.S. aid uh, to Ukraine. So that is an incredibly significant issue. But again, I don't want to use the words, I have faith in Congress, but uh, I do have faith that when the powers that be are back in control, when the adults in the room are looking at U.S. foreign policy to the rest of the world and whether we should or should not continue to aid Ukraine, I am confident that we will continue to aid uh, Ukraine. A lot of that has to do with who winds up as speaker. One of the front runners, uh, Steve Ascalis, is the number two Republican in the House. He is very much in favor of Ukrainian aid. Now, if Representative Jim uh, Jordan, Republican from Ohio, were to receive the gavel, he's very much against Ukrainian aid, but I don't see that happening. So long story, even longer. U.S. public and government support for Ukrainian aid to fight off the war crimes that are being committed by Russia in a sovereign liberal democracy are still very much there. We are still very much supportive of aid to Ukraine. Uh, and I think that once the House of Representatives, once the Republicans have a leader in the House again and we can get going, I don't doubt the aid will be there. It's interesting to point out that over in the Senate, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell are already diligently working on an aid package to Ukraine while uh, the House Republicans get their uh, House in order. So can't stress it enough. Extraordinary support for Ukrainian aid. Could it one day diminish? Absolutely. That's how American politics works, especially going into an election year. Uh, the possible um, Trump campaign in 2024. Uh, I have no doubt that pres former President Trump will win the Republican primary. Uh, he is, as of now, exponentially against aid to Ukraine, but I think even that might be political in nature. Um, having said that, I hold out a great deal of hope that continued U.S. aid will, will uh, continue to go in, not to mention NATO aid. The U.S. is not the only nation state that is sending military aid uh, to Ukraine. In addition to that, recent uh, developments that I'm sure we're all familiar with, new weapon systems like uh, like the uh, German Leopard tanks, uh, British Challenger tanks, U.S. Abrams tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles. There's an immense amount of armor that is going into Ukraine that has been in Ukraine. And we have, I forgot the number, but I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of eight, nine, ten Ukrainian brigades that have been trained uh, to fight with these new armored uh, weapon systems. I don't want to, I, I agree with you, Chris, I, I hold more optimism. Uh, but I also do not want to in any way contradict what uh, Dr. Lobota has said. If anyone here is listening, make sure to listen to Dr. Lobota above anything that I say. Uh, but again, great deal of confidence that aid from the United States to Ukraine will continue. We spend upwards of $750 billion per year on defense. What do we spend that for? We spend that money to remain competitive with near peer adversaries. And one thing that the Ukrainians have bravely shown us is that outside of the realm of nuclear weapons systems, you, the Russian Federation is no longer a peer of the United States Defense Department. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I think the only thing I, I would add is, you know, I think from a 
again, kind of thinking strategically, thinking big picture, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, yes, I, I mean, I think for rhetorical purposes, there are going to be some people in Congress that are going to be opposed to aid. I think that, um, you know, President Trump um, is going to be opposed to aid for a variety of reasons um, that, you know, um, you can't really you know, uh, do much about, frankly. Um, I mean, I think it's just part of his convictions. He's an isolationist by nature. Um, but I think for the vast majority of people in Congress on both sides of the aisle, um, you know, the the bottom line is um, that, um, you know, spending money now to help Ukraine, even though it's a lot of money, um, pales in comparison to what we'd be spending three, four, five years from now um, to defend a NATO ally if Putin were to decide that he wasn't done with Ukraine. Um, and I think that most of us, or most of, most Americans, uh, would not uh, want, you know, given the choice between having to send American forces to defend um, our NATO allies um, and um, you know, having to, you know, um, spend, you know, more, you know, like Iraq war, Afghanistan war levels of money um, and, you know, lives and that sort of thing, um, given the choice between that and, frankly, having another country do it for us, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I hate to put it in these blunt terms, but uh, from a strategic perspective, from the United States perspective, we are better off having other people fight this war for us um, rather than us having to fight it down the road um, when it's, um, you know, against an emboldened foe who um, is not going, to, as Dr. Lobota points out, is not going to stop, right? He, you know, uh, you know Putin wants the restoration of the old Russian empire. And that means Finland. That means of the eastern parts of Poland. That means um, the Baltic states, right? Um, you know, the, the, that means the Caucasus, uh, you know, the, um, the Caucasus Mountains. That means, uh, you know, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, right? Um, you know, that means, you know, a and that is not something that anybody <laughs> um, that has any sort of conception of the world, um, you know, who, who cares about anything beyond the U.S.'s borders should want, um, you know, um, unless you're the most diehard Russophile in the universe, right? Um, you know, um, the, the, that's not in America's best interest. It's not in Europe's best interest. It's not, frankly, in humanity's best interest. Um, and so, um, so, you know, a, a Russia that is bogged down in Ukraine is a Russia that is not causing more mischief elsewhere. Um, as we've seen, you know, not to skip ahead a little bit, but, you know, as we've seen in Azerbaijan, right? If Russia was not, uh, you know, distracted by trying to, you know, expand its territory in Ukraine, uh, the Azeris would not have tried to essentially wipe out the Armenian population of, um, you know, part of its country, um, you know, because, you know, the Russians were there supposedly to stop that from happening, and they just folded like a cheap tent. Um, so if the Russians can't even stand up to a country like, you know, Azerbaijan at this point, right, when they're supposed to be the neutral peacekeepers there, um, then... Then I would say that you know, well, you know, keeping keeping Russia distracted with Ukraine is good for the rest of the world, even if it isn't good for Ukraine. But but everybody else is kind of you know, um, there isn't much we can do about them, you know, being in Ukraine except have, make them lose, right? <laughs> um, at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, they're going to be in Ukraine whether we give them aid or don't give them aid, right? So. Um, you know, uh, the, this myth that, you know, the Ukrainian war will be over if we just stop giving money to the Ukrainians. No, it wouldn't be over. Um, it would just be 
bigger genocide, right? Um, you know, the but the Ukrainians wouldn't stop fighting. Um, you know, they're they don't you know uh, they there's no secret fifth column of Ukrainians that wants to be ruled by Russia. Um, if there was, Ukraine would have been defeated already. Um, you know. At least that's my perspective. Now, now maybe, um, you know, maybe other people would disagree, but that that's just my perspective. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so I think we've kind of tackled that question, but if anybody wants to um, elaborate. Um, uh, let's see. So I did have another question here. I don't know if you want to speak to this briefly, John. Um, some of the controversy. I don't know if you familiar or some of our people in the audience have been familiar with this. Uh, there have been some controversies lately, not in the United States so much as uh, some other NATO countries. Um, I know there was a controversy in Canada that led to the resignation of the Canadian Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, and I think there's also been a recent controversy involving the same person, I think, uh, in, in Britain um, about uh, honoring uh, people that uh, served in the, uh, uh, well, um, that were Ukrainians that served during World War II. Um, and uh, I don't know if you wanted to just briefly speak to that and why that was controversial and why why sometimes things are kind of complicated in Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah, th this is one of those classic examples of the value of vetting people uh, before honoring them before the Canadian House of Commons. Uh, basically, what happens here, the House of Commons, Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, Canadian Anthony Rota, uh, brought many individuals, including the president of Ukraine, uh, to speak to the Canadian House of Commons. Uh, one of the individuals, let me get his name right, uh, Yaroslav Hunka, was honored uh, by the Canadian House of Commons. There was a standing ovation. Um, for his efforts in fighting uh, during World War II against uh, the Soviet Union and the potential liberation of Ukraine that, of course, would not occur long term. The problem is that he did fight. Uh, he fought, I guess you could say valiantly, uh, but he, he fought in World War II against the Soviet Union, but he fought with the uh, 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS. So basically, the Speaker of the Canadian House of Commons, Anthony Rota, brought, I don't actually know if it was him specifically that brought this person in, but if you're the Speaker of the House, anything that happens is going to be on you. He brought a former Nazi into the Canadian House of Commons and celebrated this man for his uh, valiant fighting efforts in World War II. The, again, the problem was he fought with the SS. Um, this was a political nightmare that we could all imagine. Uh, eventually, uh, the prime minister resigned uh, his position um, from the backlash. There were uh, apologies, of course, made to the Canadian and global Jewish community for this oversight. Um, but at the end of the day, this was a horrific example of how embarrassing things can get when you don't properly vet individuals who come in to your organization when you intend to celebrate them. Um, that's, I don't see any other major, uh, elements to this story other than it was just a complete catastrophe from the perspective of improper vetting. Uh, yeah, just uh, one clarification. Yeah. It was the, uh, speaker of the house of commons, who's not the prime minister, a different person. Did um, I say, I'm sorry. But, I, I might yeah, have gone back yeah I know you misspoke. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah, it would have been even more embarrassing had, you know, um, uh, prime minister Trudeau, uh, done that, who of course be, would be actually the leader of the country, more or less. Um, yeah, I think the the only thing here, right, is that you know the yeah you know, I I mean I when you look at Eastern Europe during World War II, um, there were, there was a distinct lack of good guys. Um, is probably the best way to kind of think about things sometimes. And the problem is that uh, yeah, a lot of people that. Um, that quite rightly did not like the Soviet Union um, because um, we've talked about this before. Um, during the 1930s, under Soviet rule, there was a genocide of Ukrainians under Soviet rule called the Holodomor. Um, and 
um, many Ukrainians um, and many Poles and many other ethnic minorities in, in the Soviet Union um, hated Joseph Stalin um, for good reason, because he had perpetuated genocide against their people, had put millions of their people in concentration camps and the gulag, things like this. And um, this is all true, also true people in the Baltic states and in places like Finland. And when the Germans came, from a very misguided perspective, some people thought of them as kind of liberators. Um, now, many of them did not participate in the German you know, Holocaust and things like that, but some joined the Germans and did some of those things too. Um, and so, you know, being in Eastern Europe at that time, if you were a Ukrainian or a Pole or something like that, or a Finn um, or an Estonian, kind of keeping your powder dry, um, not being a, a Stalinist, but not being a, a Nazi, um, might have been a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, you know, and put you probably at risk of being killed by both sides. Um, so, so there were people that kind of looked at the SS and said, this is the le less bad option here. Um, of course, there are a lot of Ukrainians that didn't look at it as, as the least bad options and still stuck with the Soviets, even after the Holocaust, after the Holodomor. So, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Um, it, it's not as clean and easy and neat as it was in the West, I would say. Um, and when Westerners look at what went on in Eastern Europe, that that becomes problematic because you know you'd have to have that kind of deeper understanding but also the understanding that hey at the end of the day the ss were the nazis right um you know we're not talking about joining the german army we're talking about joining the ss the ss was part of the nazi party right it was part of their you know um you know not that the german army itself was innocent of uh, of war crimes and things like that but you know, when you're talking about, you know, the people that are committing political you know, kind of the Holocaust and things like that, not to say the, the the German army and navy and stuff weren't involved in those things, but it was at a much lesser scale. It wasn't their primary, whereas the SS, right, racial purity was part of their, like, that was their remit, right? Um, so, so, yeah, um, you know, uh, again, um, you know, um, not a lot of good guys on the Eastern Front. Let's put it that way. Um, and and a lot of people, you know, got stuck in the middle of that, and it kind of sucked for them. Um, and either way, it was going to suck for them, and it turned out it was going to suck for them for the next forty years um, of Soviet occupation. Um, in any event. Um, so we have a little, I don't know if we want to get much more into this, but we, we did talk a little bit. I did talk a little bit about the Nagorno-Karabakh situation. I don't know if you want to just briefly kind of address that, um, you know, because we've already talked a little bit about it already, but um, we are already halfway, more than halfway through. So, <laughs> Great uh, point. And it, this is an interesting uh, development regarding the Russian war crimes in Ukraine. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, this is drawing a great deal of Russian inventory from their military, specifically to Ukraine, uh, and that is leaving other areas unattended to. Uh, when you look at this area, uh, forgive me on the pronunciation, I always have to look at the name, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Karabakh. This is a, an area of land that is predominantly ethnically Armenian. And it is sandwiched inside of Azerbaijan. So for any students out there who are not familiar with the underbelly, the soft underbelly of Russia, um, above Iran, above Turkey, but below Russia, uh, you have Azerbaijan here, you have Armenia here, and they represent the southern border with Russia. Uh, it is a, and has always been, a hotly contested, uh, politically um, exciting, I guess you would say, area of the planet Earth going back to the dawn of civilization. Now, this particular area post-World War I, uh, the Soviets went in uh, and using their classic divide and conquer uh, strategy for satellite states, uh, they basically recognized and created this autonomous region that was going to be predominantly ethnic Albanian, and it's in the middle of Azerbaijan. So understandably, uh, this is not a, a recipe 
uh, for peace uh, into the future. So what we eventually wind up having happen, we have the independent uh, Republic of Karabakh declared, uh, and this is basically supported by the Soviet Union. It's also important to note that historically, the Soviets have sided more with Armenia than they have with Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan has a lot of reasons for not necessarily liking the fact that there's this Soviet-sponsored region inside their nation state that is made up predominantly of Armenians, and it's not in Armenia, it's in Azerbaijan. There's a full-scale war uh, that eventually kicks off. Um, there's a ceasefire that's declared. Fast forward to 2020 more recently, we have yet another war, and there's a Moscow brokered deal uh, calling uh, for Armenian forces to be withdrawn from Azerbaijan. 2022, fighting breaks out again uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And most recently, the Azerbaijani military uh, went in and overwhelmed the region and the Armenians have fled. That is the quickest summary I can give you for this particular region. Um, where we are now is in a situation where arguably one of the more important geopolitical realities is the simple fact that Russia or Moscow does not appear to be calling the shots in this area as of right now. Uh, they cannot rule by fiat. They, they cannot simply threaten because they have clearly lost control of this region on their southern flank. Um, that, I think, would be the most significant uh, detail, and it is directly driven, again, by the enormous amount of military inventory and resources that they are spending in their current and continued war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, it has diluted uh, Russian influence in other areas that are in their sphere of influence. Uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, yeah. There's uh, Armenia to the left. Uh, there's Azerbaijan to the right. And what you're looking at there, exactly right there, is the area that we're discussing. So I think the key takeaway outside, make no mistake, the horrible humanitarian crisis that is occurring here, uh, people who are dying are not necessarily that wedded to Azerbaijani or Armenian politics. I don't in any way mean to make light of the horrific suffering that's occurring. But overall, the story that I think we can take from this is the simple fact that Moscow does not does not have does not wield the same influence that it wielded prior to their war crimes in Ukraine. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks, John. Yeah, I, I just uh, I kind of hopefully was kind of sharing there a, a map that kind of gives you a, a little bit of a uh, illustration of. Uh, uh, Tell what we're talking about here, right? So uh, on the map, it was called Artask, which is, I'm probably mispronouncing, um, which is the uh, Armenian name for their enclave that more or less corresponded with the Garno Karabakh. Um, the Garno Karabakh is technically the, I believe, the um, Azeri name. Um, and then just to complicate things further, uh, the Azeris, I think, legally abolished uh, Nagur and Karabakh like last week or something like that. Um, so, um, but basically, right, um, a couple things, uh, a couple reasons why this is obviously you know, a, a big deal. First, um, you know, if you know, again, getting back into uh, you know, our depressing history of genocides, um, you know, Armenia itself has been subject to genocide before. Um, Armenians have been. Um, there was the Armenian genocide during the uh, latter stages of the uh, the Ottoman Empire um, and early stages of, of modern Turkey um, uh, that took place roughly around the time of World War One. Um, so you may, you know, a lot of people that are Armenian or ethnic by, Armenians by descent um, have 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 talked a lot about that in in, in uh, the American society. The Kardashian family, for example, or or ethnic Armenians, and one of their causes is, um, of course, you know, remembering the Armenian genocide and things like that. And so, obviously, you know, the um, apparent ethnic cleansing that's going on in Azerbaijan um, definitely harkens back a lot of memories for people that um, you know uh, remember you know what happened in it with uh, with Turkey. Um, and it's not also lost on you know people that are Armenian that. There, uh, uh, the Azeris and the Turks are, you know, the, the Azerbaijani language is a Turkish language, or Turkish, Turkic language. Um, they're they're ethnically related to each other. Um, so, um, you know, 
to to uh, Armenians, I think uh, you know it's perceived as sort of like the you know the sequel to the Armenian genocide. Um, and, and you know, um, and there have been cultural you know destruction and things like that that have taken place in areas that used to be inhabited by ethnic Armenians that are now ha- inhabited by Azeris and that sort of thing. So, um, so it's definitely been an area of controversy. Um, like, like, you know, John said that, you know, uh, historically this has been an area where, um, you know, that Russia was perceived as, you know, um, being on the Armenian side for better, or for worse. Um, obviously they're not in a position really apparently to, um, maintain things. Um, the way that uh, Russia wants, which, you know, then begs the broader question of, you know, can Russia um, do this elsewhere in areas of what we refer to as the frozen conflicts, right? So, for example, in, you know, there are areas of uh, the neighboring country of Georgia that are now, that are currently occupied by, um, by, Ru- by Russian-supported separatists, um, does this mean the Georgians might go on the offensive and try to get back some of that territory? Um, there's part of Moldova that's occupied by, um, which is called Transnistria, that's occupied by a pro-Russian separatist that's also on the border of Ukraine. Um, could that, you know, emerge again as a as a battlefront, you know, while Russia's distracted in uh, in uh, in Ukraine? Um, that you know the you know there could be some broader global instability uh, as a result here that you know frankly we don't know you know how that's going to play out um but um but definitely it seems like you know Russia's not in as strong a position to project its power on its borders as it was before certainly leading into the uh, the invasion of Ukraine you know last year um over the last 18 months or so uh, let's see. So let's uh, shift gears, talk a little bit some other parts of the world since we've spent the last hour or so talking about uh, Ukraine um, and, uh, and and Russia. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, I guess, first, uh, kind of the other great power we probably ought to talk about is China. Um, hard to talk about rises of great powers without talking about China, although um, uh, China is now no longer the largest country in the world. Uh, as of this year, um, India has now surpassed China in population, um, which is going to be an interesting development in and of itself. Don't have any India questions, but perhaps we should at some point at a future discussion, perhaps in the spring. Um, but uh, China has uh, been escalating uh, its uh, uh, attempts to intimidate, isolate. I'm not sure exactly what the um, the the grand strategy is uh, with regards to Taiwan over recent months. Um, is this the kind of saber rattling that they usually do in the lead up to elections? For those who don't know, Taiwan is a uh, um, well. Long story short, uh, Taiwan um, was um, is an island off the coast of China. There's actually more than one island, but there's a big island and a lot of little ones. Um, that was occupied by the Japanese up until World War II. When World War II ended, it was uh, returned to Chinese jurisdiction. Um, At the same time, China was going through a civil war. Um, The losers of the Chinese Civil War, called the Republic of China government, uh, that was backed by the United States, um, eventually failed to um, prevail lost <laughs> um, in mainland China and fled to Taiwan. And basically uh, the Chinese were, or the communists were told that basically that they were not to follow them uh, and um, and try to wipe them out. And so there was kind of this stalemate during, well, ever since essentially where Taiwan has effectively been governed by um, a different government than the rest of China. Um, that country, Taiwan, that territory, whatever you want to call it, uh, democratized around the end of the Cold War. Obviously, the rest of China did not democratize around the end of the Cold War. Um, Google Tiananmen Square if you want to know about why that didn't happen. Um, and ever since, there's been kind of this weird stalemate where, on the one hand, there's a lot of cooperation, across, particularly economic cooperation. A lot of China's Mainland China's economic development has relied on Taiwanese investment and Taiwanese um, expatriates, um, you know, um, 
A lot of the big companies that we think of in the tech industry were started by Taiwanese investors and things like that, um, and, but they operate in mainland China. Um, so there's a lot of economic ties across, but at the same time, there's also a lot of military saber rattling as well. And when uh, the Republic of China, when Taiwan has its elections, uh, the uh, the communists uh, occasionally like to remind the Taiwanese who their neighbors are um, with a bit of saber rattling. So, um, so is this just the typical saber rattling? Is there more to it? Is this kind of part of a broader Chinese strategy, perhaps? Or, you know, what, what you know, uh, how would you how would you assess what's going on here? Um, and perhaps also keep in mind in the back of our heads, you know, the situation with uh, um, Ukraine and Russia and how that might kind of play into Chinese thinking or lack thereof here. Great question, Chris. Um, I uh, I hesitate to say anything as potentially stupid as there will not be a war. However, here I'm overwhelmingly confident this is saber rattling and nothing more. Um, China, or more to the point, uh, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping has not ascended to near total power in the Chinese Communist Party by being stupid. Invading proactively out of, you know, launching a war of choice across the Taiwan Strait to invade Taiwan might be the single dumbest thing I can possibly imagine China doing. And there is no way, in my opinion, uh, as a constitutional law professor, there is absolutely no way that China would ever commit such a horrifically stupid act for several reasons. First and foremost is we have to recognize that China's growth over the last few decades, where they were hitting 10% and above growth rates, that's over. Uh, they have demographic nightmares that they have to contend with. Uh, they have a extreme rapid urbanization on the one hand, plus the devastating policy that goes back to Mao, of the one child only policy, has left them with a population that really cannot support itself very well. They don't have enough young people. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, China, while they have been militarizing exponentially more than they had in the past over the last few decades, they are building a more impressive uh, Navy uh, than they had in the past. It is still not competitive with the U.S. Uh, Navy. Uh, the U.S. Navy is still by far the single most important entity for guaranteeing uh, the globalized economy that we have today for maintaining safe uh, sea routes for the whole world. The U.S. Navy protects China's ability uh, to trade globally. China has become the largest importer of food and energy of all other nation states on the planet. Now, just think about that. China is the largest importer of food. Now, imagine if what happened when you when the Russian you, when the Russian war crimes were launched against Ukraine. Look at the global response. Look at the sanctions on Russia. Imagine that or the equivalent of that on China. I think it's safe to say that outside of some very strange preemptive strike by Taiwan that would literally never happen, if China were to invade Taiwan without any um, reason for doing so, there is no national security. If they just decide to invade Taiwan, I can see global sanctions against China that would be equal to or even more so than those that are currently on Russia. Just looking at some of the numbers, they import uh, more soybeans, corn, wheat, rice, and dairy products than any other country. Imagine sanctions with that particular reality. Uh, they're over dependent on other nation states for things like seeds. We don't really think of seeds when we think of global flu uh, food security, uh, but about 70% of all agricultural biotechnology patents are owned by American companies. Imagine all of this being cut off to China. Another important detail to look at would be where a lot of this food comes from. When you look at something like soybeans, the majority of Chinese soybeans come from the United States and Brazil. These are two nation states that I think would definitely be able to get together on sanctions for China if they invaded Taiwan. Not to mention, if you look at corn, the US and Ukraine, I had to look this up. I was shocked when I saw this. 98% of China's corn imports come from the US and Ukraine. Imagine 98% of your corn imports being cut off. This would lead to a humanitarian tragedy of China's own making. Um, for what gain? There, There is no gain. Um, Taiwan, nothing against Taiwan. They are important in their own right. 
they are the semiconductor capital of the world, producing about 90% of the planet Earth semiconductors. That's another reason I can't imagine China invading and cutting off that infrastructure. The thought of China invading Taiwan just because they feel like it is literally impossible for me to make that make sense in my head. It would be um, agricultural suicide. Uh, they have a growing military, but let's face it, and don't get me wrong, I look at this as a good thing that China can look to, but they haven't been in a shooting war since 1979 against Vietnam. Again, not being in a war since 1979, I look at that as a compliment to China, but you don't just build a military and have it automatically know how to fight. You need decades of experience in your officer corps, in your, in your enlisted uh, personnel. It's, again, this is one of those areas that I can talk for the rest of the night, and I am pretty sure no one wants me to. Uh, so I'm gonna try to find a good spot to stop. Being the world's largest food importer, being the world's largest energy importer, uh, having the demographic challenges that China is going to be facing over the next 10 years without an invasion of Taiwan, I can't imagine China actually deciding uh, to do that. The, the global response against China would be so devastating. And quite frankly, the, the memories from the Great Famine from the late 50s and early 1960s from the devastating Mao policies on agricultural uh, reform, that is still fresh in the minds of many of the elderly Chinese leadership. Uh, and I think they would recognize the unimaginable horror that would occur if there was a global, if there was a series of global sanctions against China, which I believe would definitely happen. So I, I can't possibly imagine China just deciding to invade Taiwan. Rattle sable, sabers? Absolutely. Militarily, it's not a foregone conclusion that China would be able to successfully conquer Taiwan. If I were in Las Vegas and had to bet, okay, maybe they could, but they would lose so many personnel, so much infrastructure. We have armed Taiwan to the by God teeth. They are prepared. Their entire military and with using sophisticated weapon systems is prepared for one thing, stopping a Chinese invasion. So I think the lessons learned from Russia over estimating their capabilities and being able to conquer Ukraine in a matter of days. I think China's paying attention to all of this. China recognizes their own limitations. I cannot imagine China deciding to attack Taiwan essentially because they are bored or want to look like a powerful military on the global stage. So no, now what I am concerned with, the saber rattling comes with real costs. Uh, Chinese naval forces in the Strait of Taiwan in close proximity with US Arleigh Burke destroyers who are going on right of passage or freedom of passage maneuvers. There is the possibility that Chinese naval forces, American naval forces, Taiwanese naval forces could accidentally, literally bump into one another and maybe an incident could escalate. But I could not imagine this being a purposeful policy decision made uh, by Xi. I just can't imagine that. And anyone else is welcome to jump in and give the more depressing counter that they will. But again, no, not at all. I cannot imagine China invading Taiwan. Of all the problems we have to worry about, and we have a lot, I just don't think that's one of them. No, I, mean, I think you're, I think you're probably right. Um, I mean, I think the the only, well, the pessimistic, right? The uh, you know putting on the pessimistic hat for a moment here, right? Um, first, right, you do have the potential blunder into war sort of scenario that you kind of elaborated on. I think that's that's a possibility. Um, the other possibility is. You know that uh, you know we've already seen, right? That there are states that overestimate their capacity. That think, you know, um, Xi has. Um, I, I think fair. Uh, I think it's fair to say um, consolidated power by surrounding himself with people that tell him what he, what he wants to hear. Um, and that sounds a lot like another leader we could talk about. Um, is he a more rational leader than Putin? I don't know. Um, the The thing about China is, you know, you people don't really know though. Nobody knows that much about China. Uh, you know, the, the um, you know, the, I mean, there's a reason why you know, oh, you know, well, 
any sort of authoritarian totalitarian regime is hard to sort of penetrate but but the chinese regime in particular uh, is one that you know is, uh, western analysts have a lot of difficulty trying to understand um I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the only caveat I, w- I would give is that my, um, and, and this is something I, I do see people talk about occasionally on social media and things like this, is, is there a, uh, is, the, um, is there a fifth column in Taiwan, right? Um, is there, are there elements of the Taiwanese regime, the Taiwanese government, right, that would enable... China to sort of sneak in the back door, right? That's the thing that, um, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not like you, a lot you can do about it if you have people that are disloyal um, and are willing to sort of help, um, you know, the um, the communists take over. Um, you know, the I, I've heard reports. I don't know how credible they are. That you know, the the tra- the Taiwanese intelligence services are are essentially um, completely infiltrated by the communists. Um, is that true? I don't know. It's just stuff I've heard on social media that by people that seem like they know what they're talking about. But that and you know, six bucks will buy you a latte at Starbucks today, right? Um, you know, they sound like they know what they're talking about. They have the credentials. But do they know anything more than I do, right? Um, that's the only thing I, I, I kind of worry about with, with Taiwan is not so much that you would have an open shooting war, but and, and you know, but you could have a scenario where there is sufficient political economic pressure on Taiwan where the the government is coerced into some sort of arrangement with China that erodes its sovereignty right that that you know you that is sort of the the that would be my fear with taiwan is that not that taiwan would you know just suddenly be invaded but but essentially would be kind of converted right it would be subjugated um you know through through the economic and political ties because the taiwanese leadership would be too fearful of they don't want to be the ones to destroy themselves, right? Yeah. You know, um, and so, yeah. You know, um, and I don't know, you know, if if the Taiwanese put themselves in that situation, who are we to stop them from putting themselves in that situation, right? I guess you have to ask yourself. But, um, you know, that that's a where they if they were to become overly dependent on the mainland, if they were to become overly or just you know where essentially they could be blackmailed into giving up their independence, right? Um, I, I would say, however, that um, that would have been much easier five years ago, right? Um, because Xi, um, out of his paranoia and fear that somebody is going to you know oust the Communist Party from power, has you know. Cracked down dissent in in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong was always sort of the model for well, you know, the Chinese communists can be trusted to maintain this one one country two systems sort of arrangement, right? You know that we can have kind of this this oasis of freedom alongside the communists, and they can all it can all it can all coexist, and basically Xi has. Proven that the model doesn't uh, that he doesn't believe in that model, right? Because he has basically said, I don't trust the, the you know, we we can't even let the people of Hong Kong like remember that Tiananmen Square happened, right? Um so so I I think that's the sort of that would um that would be that would be more of a concern five years ago. Now the Taiwanese are going to say, "Look, you know, we know we're going to get, you know, there is no guarantee that we keep our one country, two systems, right? There's no guarantee we preserve our democratic elections. There's no guarantee we preserve our self defense or you know our freedom of travel, our you know our kind of our system, right? Because because Xi has proven he can't be trusted, right?" 
Um, and again, five years ago, that argument you, it was harder to make, right? Today, I think if you're, you know, unless you're kind of a hardcore reunification supporter, um, then I, I think it's um, less of a concern, right? Um, I mean, I think more, or le, le, less of a concern in the sense that I don't think I don't think most Taiwanese really want to be assimilated into China, right? Um, under China on on China's terms, right? Um, and the and you know the, any sort of overtures of partnership are going to be seen, I think, quite rightly, much more skeptically than they were would have been five, 10, 15 years ago, because, because again, I think the, you know, Hong Kong was a short-term success for the communists, but a long-term complete and utter screw up because it, it proved they were not credible. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, that that's something that people sometimes forget is, you know, okay, you can get away with it one time, but, you know, the next time around, nobody's going to believe it, you, you, right? Um, so, so anyway, um, we do have a couple of questions related to that from the chat. Let me look real quick if we want to kind of follow up on that. Um, uh, we have a question. Is Taiwan the only country you can't imagine being attacked by China? Um or can imagine. I, I'm, I'm not sure if exactly if I understand that question. Um, um, are is there anybody else that China might be attacking? Um, I, I wouldn't think so. But um, I mean, uh, the China has had border skirmishes before um, with with Russia um, and with India, um, and so. So the you know those are remote possibilities. Um, I can't see China going to war with any of the either of those countries. Um, there was uh, kind of amusingly um, some uh, uh, the Chinese government allowed some uh, some literature to be published a while ago that showed like Chinese claims to take over like you know Vladivostok and stuff like that, which normally they wouldn't let people publish. Um, so. Again, though, I think China does a lot of stuff as sort of a safety valve for a lot of the problems that China that that John was talking about in terms of their internal population management. They they use nationalism domestically uh, in a way to try to kind of maintain power, um, and so they allow people to kind of indulge in these nationalist fantasies without them really becoming their policy. Um, so I don't, I don't see any real prospect now. Now, an extremely weakened Russia, you know, maybe our bets are off with China. I don't know. Um, but then again, you know, Russia still has nuclear weapons, right? Um, again, going back to deterrence, right? Um, maybe they don't work, uh, <laughs> but do you want to be the country that tests that? Right. Um, you know, a lot of things in Russia don't work, but do you want to be the country that uh, that figure that that is going to be the one to to learn firsthand um, whether or not the the Russians really can nuke you or not? Um, I don't want to be that country um, unless I absolutely have to. Right. I don't think the Chinese really want to either. Um, so. But um, but you could see an extremely weakened Russia you know, in that situation, but, um, but uh, it seems unlikely in the at least short to medium term, certainly um, they would have to become a lot weaker than they are now. I think for other countries to start thinking they're slim pickings for, you know, it's one thing to sort of kick them out of your own territory like the Azeris did more or less or are doing. Um, it's kind of a different thing to, uh, you know, go and, you know, capture Vladivostok, um, which, or the or the Shanklins or something, right? Um, which is which country is a bigger threat to the United States? Russia, China, another country? Um, none of the above. Uh, um, I, I would say threat in what sense, right? Um, 
threat to the global order um and indirectly the united states i'd say probably china um just because china sees itself as a rival power and on the rise and um wants to uh, and it has more of a, an ability to assert itself um that said i don't see china as a country that has any aspiration to conquer or take over anything that the United States currently has, right? Um, so, in a, um, and nor does Russia, right? I mean, you know, yeah, Russia occasionally publishes a map where it takes over Alaska again. Um, but again, is that, uh, you know, Russia's in no position to actually deliver on that threat, right? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the the bigger question is not so much are they threats to the United States, but are they threats to American hegemony and to the world order that the uh, that are, that favors the United States? In which case, I'd say yeah, probably China is the biggest threat to that, followed closely by Russia and perhaps India. Um. And I don't even know if India is a threat to it. Uh, India, India again, largest country in the world now, um, definitely has some nationalist aspirations, definitely has some regional aspirations in terms of the subcontinent, um, definitely wants to be a global player. Um, but I don't uh, I don't think the India, Indian government sees itself as wanting to. I, they don't want to be the global hegemon, right? They they don't want, and, and fundamentally, I, I think the the Indian government sees the world order as it is today as more or less in its interests, um, as does the United States. So, so there's a lot of that's why you talk, why you hear a lot about American cooperation with India because America and India actually have a lot of common interests, um. Uh, and to some extent, you know, we have a lot of common interests with China. China, China's interests are best served by the the current global order too. Um, you know, um, for the most part, I mean, they would like to have more influence in the global order. Um, but as far as their economy is concerned, the global order is set up very well for them um, economically. Um, Russia is a disruptive power, right? Russia doesn't like the global order as it is today. Um, but 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 on their own, they're not enough. Uh, they don't have enough power to really do much about it, right? Um, so I mean, yeah, there's always talk of an alliance between Russia and India and China and to you know create an alternative world order, or whatever, but. But arguably, their you know, their differences are bigger than what they have in common, right? What they have in common is basically they just want to be in charge. But beyond there, it, it's a squabble over who would be in charge, right? So, and realistically, none of them are going to be in charge. So, you know, I I think that at the end of the um, end of the day, it's more about influence. It's more about and that's where you do see the competition, where you do see China trying to exert influence abroad, right? Where it's trying to not necessarily impose its view of the world, but trying to, I guess, carve out a space where it kind of can get more of what it wants, which I guess all countries really do um, through things like foreign aid and things like that. But a lot of that is driven by domestic Chinese issues like the lack of population like the has all china has spent a lot of energy and resources trying to developing things like infrastructure capacity and it's running out of things to do it with right it's running out of china to build roads in it's running out of china to build high-speed rail in and so they built all this capacity to do this and now they need to go they either need to use it or lose it right um and so so that's what you're seeing with China, right? I think um, more than anything else is that you know that's what Belt and Road is fundamentally about. Is you know okay, well you know well, you know let's let's get the you know these developing countries to pay us to come and build high high speed rail in their countries, right? And build freight rail and things like that, which on the surface doesn't sound all that 
exciting or glamorous or you know even threatening um you know the fear is i guess that well china is going to control all this stuff but the reality is it's still going to be in those countries right so you know yeah, they're going to owe something to China, but are they going to really owe that much to China, right? At the end of the day, China has, you know, you know, China isn't going to be able to enforce anything on anybody, right? Um, and maybe that's why they're building their military is so they can go and, you know, have their, you know, their boats show up in your ports when you stop paying off your loans, right? <laughs> that's maybe that's their perspective. I don't know. Those are great points, Chris. I would add, I would go even a step further in terms of threats. Um, I mentioned briefly the demographic problems that China has. I, I, I can't stress those enough, uh, the population crunch. They have problems that over the next decade, I honestly don't know how they're going to solve. Uh, Russia, I like I said earlier, I think they've shown that they are not a near peer to the US. I would literally rather fight, if nuclear weapons are off the table, I would rather fight Russia than fight Poland. Uh, and, and I mean that. Um, Beyond that, I think I just don't see any individual nation states that represent national security threats to the United States. I think the biggest threat to the United States, as it has been for quite some time, is the United States. Um, I think a breakdown in democratic values, uh, the fact that we have two major political parties and one of them, the majority of registered voters in the Republican Party do not consider President Joe Biden to be the legitimate president of the United States. That is exponentially more dangerous than anything you could find in China or Russia. Having that many Americans who with absolutely no empirical data to back it up, just they just believe it. That many Americans who do not believe in the legitimacy of the current president, that is terrifying. What makes liberal democracy so difficult, one of the things, is losing. You have to be able to lose, look at your opponent and say, you won and I'm gonna sit back and plan for the next election. For the first time in American history, including a civil war where we had midterm elections and presidential elections during the civil war without really any violence, we had violence. Uh, and again, we have this, this lingering belief that is questioning the legitimacy of American democratic theory at a time when it really shouldn't. American elections are quite uh, clean. They're some of the best in the world and we have data to back that up. So again, I think I don't see a nation state out there that represents a threat to the United States. I think the United States is the only threat to the United States. And, and I don't mean that in an American centric, you know, pounding our chest, you know, USA kind of way. I, I mean that legitimately. Nor do I see China as even having aspirations, like Chris mentioned, of conquering the United States. They want influence. They want influence in the South China Sea and economic influence around the world. Now, when it comes to rare earth elements, that's a different story. China has got the vast majority of them, and that's a different uh, discussion for a different time as we are re-engineering our transportation economy to go with fully um, electric automobiles. There's a lot of rare earth elements that you have to have to have these car batteries, and China's got most of them. Sorry for the total tangent there. Nah, well, you know, it's... it's in, Wouldn't be the first one in this conversation. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, well, we're close to adjournment time. I, I will say that you know, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm far be it for me to disagree with my colleague. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that he's right in the sense that, you know, the 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 only thing we have to fear is not fear itself. Um, you know, but but ourselves in the sense of you know, um, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm not a doom and gloom person. I don't think that we're we're you know on the verge of democratic collapse or anything like that. Um, having said that, um, you know, because I think it put, when push comes to shove, a lot of people like um, you know uh, the rhetoric is very heated to the point of being absurd um, and insane. Um, but the people that spew it have mostly proven to be paper tigers, right? Um, and then, you know, the if that's the silver lining, I don't know, but it, it is silver lining. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, Donald Trump is scared of going to prison, right? Um, and if you don't believe it, just watch his body language when he's in court. You know, he's scared of losing his money 
even, right? Much less going to prison, right? You know, in this civil case that's going on in New York, right? You know, um, and and so, you know, the idea that this guy is going to, you know, lead some sort of revolution, um, I, I think, you know, is is kind of far fetched. Um, that said, um, you know. He, he can certainly get a bunch of crazy people to show up at a particular place at a particular time and wreak some havoc, um, as we've seen, right, uh, January 6th. Um, and so, you know, the question is, was that, did that uh, did that sort of exhaust that, that pool of people willing to do that, or are there more of those people out there, right? Um, my suspicion is that, for the the number of people that really were going to go beyond talk to action, I think most of them showed up on January 6th, and most of them are now on their way to, if not in jail um, or prison or that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, it, um, unless, unless you see a regime kind of tipping over, it's very hard to mobilize people to get off their couch and actually, like, go out and, like, like bring down a, a a government, right? Um, you know, when we think about historical, you know, cases like you know the beer hall push, right? You know, a hundred years ago in Germany, right? Um, you know, that's a hundred years ago, literally a hundred years ago, right? And uh, you know, that was not a lot of people, right? Um, you know, that was probably about the size, order of magnitude of of January sixth, right? Um, if that's all. And most of those people are in jail. And most of those people are going to be in jail. Um, then I'm not too worried about it. Um, if, on the other hand, there, you know, this is kind of the the tip of the iceberg, then I am worried about it, right? Um, I guess my, my only other sort of concern way to that is, you know, um, and this is a concern not just for the United States, but a lot of other countries that are kind of in the same boat is we have you know, a disaffected population that isn't getting what it wants out of the political system and can't get what it wants out of the political system and figuring out good um, what is the way to channel that into something more productive or more valuable, right, um, or more realistic, right? Um, I mean, I, you know... In a few countries, right, you know, they have an electoral system that basically just funnels them into a party that gets 20% of the vote but has no power, and you can just kind of ignore them and hope they go away, um, and that works for a while. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for – we don't have that system, right? Um, so how do you so, sort of funnel this free-floating ennui about the political system um, – bordering on violent fantasy um into something that is actually good for our society um that that to me is much more of a threat than Vladimir Putin or Z or that sort of thing is you know how do we figure that out and um and maybe maybe there is no figuring that out maybe maybe it's just a, a phase maybe people just kind of okay they just wake up one day and say oh, that was kind of weird when we all went around and liked the guy that looked like he was a Cheeto, uh, and then, you know, and then go back to their normal lives. Um, you know, that was weird. Um, or, you know, maybe it gets worse. I don't know. Um, that's, that's why we have the social sciences, right? Is, you know, we're trying to figure these things out. Um, but, um, in any event, um, we have gone kind of over time. Um, and I'm just rambling at this point, so this is a good point probably for us to, to adjourn before I say something really stupid as opposed to something just plain stupid, like I probably said already. Um, so I um, would like to uh, thank our uh, guests. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lavoda uh, for, for joining us. I like, uh, appreciate his insights, and um, hopefully uh, for for his country's sake and for his sake that um, that you know that his pessimism turns out to be wrong. Um, I'd be no, that, um, not to say that, um, 
Well, I, I, I'd be delighted if he were wrong. Um, unfortunately, my, my, my experience of human events is that um, being a pessimistic uh, person doesn't always win you a lot of friends, but, um, but sometimes it turns out you're, you're right. Um, but I hope he's wrong um, for his sake, for the Ukrainian people's sake, for the world's sake. I hope he's wrong. Um, but I would like to thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Hall for, for taking time out of his evening as well. I'd like to thank our audience for their questions and thoughts and listening to us ramble um, this evening, as well as our colleagues that joined us as well. Um, we do have another event probably coming up in about three weeks. We're going to sk uh, skip ahead a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about domestic policy, upcoming elections, that sort of thing. Uh, not upcoming elections in New Zealand, but uh, we do have a few state elections and things like that coming up. So we'll probably talk a little bit about those things, but mostly about um, what, I would, uh, what I refer to as domestic policy potpourri. Um, which um, for those of you younger than about 40, they used to, on Jeopardy, they used to have categories and usually the last one was something like something potpourri or something. I don't think they do that anymore. Um, um, and maybe they only did that on Saturday and I'll have sketches. I don't know. But, um, but in any event, that's kind of the, the working title for that uh, topic. Um, and that will be the week of the 23rd, I believe. Um, we might know, we're probably going to do it on the Monday rather than the Wednesday, but we're going to finalize that uh, soon. Um, I don't know if anybody here is looking to go to graduate school, but in about a couple of weeks, we're also going to be having a uh, informational session about our Doctor of Public Safety program. Um, that's why we're not going to be doing this in two weeks. Um, so probably doesn't apply to anybody here. I don't think anybody is likely to be graduating in December and looking to start a doctoral program, but... Um, but nonetheless, um, I did want to mention that very briefly. It, it, you can read about that on Inside MGA if you're interested in that. Um, or just interested in possibly doing something like that down the road, because um, that program is going to be here. Um, so when you graduate, um, so if that sounds like something you might be interested in, it might be worth just learning a little bit about it even now. Um, Anything else, Dr. Hall, you wanted to add? or I think else? that does, just about does it. Um, I think we were able to cover some uh, large areas as uh, concisely as possible. Thank you all for joining all the students. Uh, thank you, everyone else, for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Beek, for being here. And y'all have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you all. And uh, hope uh, we will uh, uh, again be able to uh, talk about some more happy topics uh, when we meet again. Um, so thank you all. Good evening and uh, see you all uh, hopefully in about three weeks or so.